My dear brothers and sisters, on this octave day of Christmas, we celebrate the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. As a church, we always use the octave, that is, seven days after a feast, to highlight something very important to the main feast we're celebrating. The two main octaves that we have in the church are Easter and Christmas. We see at Easter, seven days later, we have Divine Mercy Sunday. That is the idea of God's mercy forgiving us our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. In this Christmas octave, we have Mary the Mother of God to show that with the gift of Christ Jesus, we have the gift of Mary called Mother of God at the Council of Ephesus. But we want to make sure, brothers and sisters, that we don't misunderstand what it means that Mary is Mother of God. When I was in high school, we had to do Greek religion, uh, taking courses in literature, and we read some of the Greek mythology. And in that, you would have gods who would give birth to other gods. That's not what we mean when we say that Mary is mother of God. She doesn't give origin to the divinity of Jesus. Instead, we should rather call Mary Theotokos, which is the Greek word for mother of God. It means the one who bore God in her womb. Because Jesus Christ, the word incarnate, is truly human and truly God. God incarnate. So because of who Jesus is, that shows us that Mary is mother of God. But today we also celebrate the World Day of Peace instituted by the Pope a few decades ago. And it is very appropriate that we associate this Christmas season with peace. Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, he comes to establish the peace of God's kingdom. And Mary, our mother, helps in her role. And when I was praying about what to speak about this morning, a scripture passage came to me. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And this is what it says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are called, brothers and sisters, to present our every concern, our every anxiety to God in prayer, to see God manifest His care, to see Him Make present his peace. And he, in fact, does that many times. Many times he also does that through the intercession of the saints, like the Blessed Virgin Mary. Back in 1531 in Mexico, there was a bit of a problem because the conquistadors were maltreating the native Mexican people and the bishop there, Bishop Zamoraga, a Franciscan, wrote the king of Spain a letter and told him that if this situation doesn't change, the people of Mexico, the native people, would never accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he ended his letter with a prayer to God. Shortly thereafter, God replied by sending Mary to visit an Indian man by the name of Juan Diego, now St. Juan Diego. And when Mary appeared to Juan Diego, she called herself Our Lady Guadalupe, and she said to him, Do not be troubled by the littlest thing. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not in the folding of my arms? Are you not under my mantle? Do you need anything else? Of course, these were all rhetorical questions. But this, brothers and sisters, is the role that Mary takes in our lives. 
Now, when we were preparing for our Marian consecration this past Advent, we read what St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta believed would be Mary's role in our lives. And wouldn't you know it, I happened to drop the pamphlet over here. St. Mother Teresa delineates kind of a covenant, that is, a relationship between Mary and the individual Christian. This is what Mother Teresa had to say. She said, Mary has the duty to give of her spirit and heart to us. And we have the duty to give to her the gift of all we have and are. That Mary has the duty to possess, protect, and transform us by her prayers. That we have the duty of total dependence upon her and upon her motherly care. That Mary is called to inspire, guide, and enlighten us through the Holy Spirit. We are called to be responsive to her spirit, that is the spirit that God gave to her. We're called, Mary is called to share her experience of prayer and praise. And what mother wouldn't teach their children that very same thing? We are called, on our behalf, to be faithful to prayer. Mary is called to be responsible for our sanctification, that Christ Jesus may be formed in us perfectly, and we are called to trust in her intercession. Mary has responsibility for all that befalls us, much like a mother is responsible for her children. We are called to accept all the good and the bad is coming from her and is not being outside her care. She is called to share with us her virtues, just as a mother passes on virtues to her children. We are called to imitate her spirit of praise, of thanksgiving, of trust in God, of pointing to Jesus, of proclaiming the gospel. Mary is called to provide for our spiritual and material needs. We are called to have constant resource recourse to her. She is called to share her heart with us. And we are called to remember that she is present in our lives. She has to purify us and our actions, and we are called to a purity of intention. That is, that we want to remember to have pure intentions and to practice a little bit of self-denial to help cooperate with that. Mary has the right to dispose of us of our prayers and intercessions and graces. Don't worry. She doesn't dispose of the people. We have the right to avail ourselves of her and her energies for the sake of the kingdom of God. She has the right of total freedom in and around us as she pleases in all things. And we have the right to enter into her heart and to share her interior life. Now, brothers and sisters, in case this sounds just like some pious exercise, that means that the person who has recourse to Mary might grow holy and become a saint, but not have much effect on the world itself. We want to remember our recent history. <clears throat> Let me give a story about a country who trusted in Mary and had what was called the Rosary Revolution. Picture this, the Philippines, 1986. Ferdinand Marcos's dictatorship is drawing towards an end, and he tries to arrest the defense minister and a general who was in, in charge of a bunch of troops, as well as 300 troops that were trying to resist Marcos's dictatorship. These folks decide they're going to barricade themselves in a barracks in Manila. And Marco decides he's going to send 6,000 troops and 25 tanks as a way to break the barricade. The folks held up in the barracks appealed to Cardinal Jaime Sin. Cardinal Sin, what an unfortunate name, right? Well, but that's his name. Cardinal Sin, and asked... For the church to intervene. Cardinal Sin called upon the Filipino people to pray for the Blessed Virgin Mary, but specifically to go right in the street between Marcos's troops and the ones in the barracks. 
Two million Filipinos showed up and began praying the rosary, singing songs to Mary. The priests were celebrating Mass, helping and, and exhorting the people. And Marcos, getting so upset, he decides he's going to give an order for the troops to attack the barracks and to roll over the people if, if need be. The troops begin, the people all kneel down and hold their rosaries up, and all of a sudden the troops kind of stop and decide to join the people, and the people hand them flowers and give them sandwiches. Very Filipino. I love the fact that they're so attentive to food. And hug them and embrace them. Well, that infuriated Marcos, and he decided he was going to have the crowd tear gassed. So he gives the order, they shoot the tear gas. The wind shifts, and it, and it ends up covering the people who shot the tear gas, and they had to run and flee, not the crowd. So he got even more upset. He decides he's going to send an order for the military to mortar the barracks. And at first, the guys can't find the target for some reason. And then when they are able to fix the target, they send the mortars, and it's as if they were blanks. They did no, there was no explosions. So finally Marcos decides he's going to send an elite helicopter squad. They end up landing and joining the people too. Frustrated, Marcos flees the Philippines and ends up in Hawaii. And the widow of an assassinated opposition leader by the name of Corazon Aquino becomes president of the Philippines. What looked like it was going to be civil war ended pretty much peacefully with only the death of 12 people. Afterwards, people reported that that first day when the soldiers were attacking the people, that suddenly a woman appeared, brilliant and radiant, and she said to the troops, My dear children, do no harm to my children. And that that's why they decided to join the people. So brothers and sisters, if this is what Mary can do for an entire country, what can it do for ours? What can it do for our society, our church, which sometimes is faced with division? Our families that are sometimes divided? Our society, though we're not at the brink of civil war, we are much more divided than we've ever been. It is time, brothers and sisters, that we pick up the peacemaker. Now, growing up in a military family, the term peacemaker was obviously a euphemism for a military weapon that would cause destruction. This here, instead, is a military weapon, but a weapon of peace. It is the Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, <clears throat> capable of delivering a payload of 53 Hail Marys, six Our Fathers, six Glory Bees, one Creed and one Hail Holy Queen to the enemy. For those of you who like high-capacity clips, there is the Franciscan crown. 72 Hail Marys, seven Glory Bees, seven Our Fathers. When you absolutely positively have to expel every demon in your territory except no substitutes. Padre Pio would often say, this is the weapon of our time, the rosary. Invoking the Blessed Virgin Mary, honoring her, following the fourth commandment because Jesus gave us Mary as our spiritual mother on the cross when he was dying, John chapter 19. So we honor Mary by remembering what God inspired the Archangel Gabriel and Elizabeth, her cousin, to say to Mary. And then just simply asking for Mary's intercession. You will never see, ever, a prayer written that is Catholic. You will never see a prayer written that worships Mary. You will never see a Mass offered to Mary. You will only ever find our worship and our Mass being offered to God the Father 
through Jesus Christ the Son, in the Holy Spirit, and it may be in remembrance of some aspect of how God worked in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But an aspect that calls us to participate in the grace of God. Mary, as a mother, and as she did it at Cana in Galilee, only and always points us to a greater relationship with her son, Jesus Christ. That we might be completely and totally his. So we just ask this day for the grace. The grace to be more devoted to Mary, to trust more in her intercession for us, since God has obviously given her to his people as a special patron and protectress. And we simply pray. Remember, O most blessed Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your assistance, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly to you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency, hear and answer them. Amen.